May God be with you. I'm very honored to be asked to uh, preach this day a word. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Michelle Slater, and I was settled back when we did that to this congregation in July 1999 and served here for four years in ministry. This was my pulpit, <laughs> and I feel a little nostalgic about it. Um, I was thinking it's about 50, it is 15 years this fall that the Reverend Maggie Enright was here preaching at my own covenanting service. And I see people like Phil Spencer, uh, who was enormously supportive uh, of me, especially in the first uh, few years when I needed lots of support and Minnie Hornage and other people that I served with in the presbytery. Let us pray. Holy God, your word has power, power to create, power to disturb, power to heal. Help us all to hear your word for us this day. Amen. A few years ago, I was invited to a 50th anniversary party, and it was very special because it wasn't the anniversary of a couple, although those are special enough. This was the 50th anniversary of an Alcoholics Anonymous group that met in my church where I was the minister. And there were even a few members there who had been, who had been founding members and who had been part of that group for the 50 years. If you're not familiar with Alcoholics Anonymous or AA or the 12 Steps, it's a movement whose members have two clear purposes and nothing more, to stay sober themselves and to inspire and help others achieve that same sobriety. This AA group met every Thursday night no matter what. During the summer, when the building was closed to refinish the gym floors, on every stat holiday, even one year on Christmas Day, because the name of their group was Lifeline. And for many members, it was exactly that. It was the first meeting of an AA group that I had ever been invited to, and I was curious to see what would happen. First, everyone was welcomed, and visitors were asked to introduce themselves. Then a portion of the book, Alcoholics Anonymous, was read, that foundational text written by AA founder Bill W. And it was always about some aspect of one of the 12 steps of the program. After the reading, there was time to celebrate and honor people who had achieved a milestone in their sobriety. One month, two months, six, one year, two years, five years, 50. On the anniversary of someone's quitting drinking, they are celebrated with a cake because it is like their new birthday, the day they were born again. And after that came the sharing. The chairperson of the evening, which rotates throughout the fellowship, called on various members of the group, often without warning ahead of time, to share their story with particular relation to the theme of the night. That evening, the theme was one day at a time. And one by one, those who were called on to speak came to the front and shared their story of being lost and being found of being controlled by alcohol, and then of finding freedom, of knowing a way of death, and having revealed to them a way of life. And each speaker, I noticed, spoke about one or two or three other people in that group who had been especially important for them, who had welcomed them without judgment, but who had also demanded searing honesty from them who had loved them when they couldn't love themselves, who understood exactly what they were going through because they had been through it themselves, and who helped them find a new way to live, a way that gave life. These people, they said, had become their family, because like many people who achieve sobriety, their family of origin or their relationships and community found it hard to deal with the newly sober person. Some of them found it hard to trust. Some of them were used to that person playing that role in their life 
and couldn't make the switch with them. And I was struck by the huge variety of people in that group. There were young adults, some dressed in business suits and some with multicolored hair and earrings in their nose. There were middle-aged professionals and people in their 70s and 80s. There were people from every walk of life and every socioeconomic background and class. But no matter who spoke, each one began by thanking God or their higher power as they understood it, and the whole group. Each of them spoke of how central the community had been in their survival in their new life. And some told of a moment in their first meeting, or their second, or their tenth, when they saw the freedom others were living and thought, I want that for myself. And each spoke about how hard it had been and still was sometimes to keep living this new life. The group's name told you what every person was there for. It was literally and figuratively their lifeline. I was extremely moved, moved by the power of God so evidently at work in that community of people, however people imagined it or understood it or spoke about it and deeply moved by the affirmation of the community's vital role in AA. I realized again the powerful ways that God works through human beings, through each other, through human community. I mean, how many people here would say that community or a sense of belonging or a sense of family is why you belong to church? Hands up. It's true, isn't it? Many, if not most of us, would identify that strong sense of belonging to something bigger than ourselves, being part of community in which we can find our place, in which, to which we can be accountable, a community which cares for us and values us as one of the central reasons for belonging to a community of faith. And we know that people in every place and every time have longed for and needed human community. If you look online, you can find groups of people who gather around every kind of interest or cause imaginable, and some you couldn't even imagine, and some you wouldn't even want to imagine. So what makes being part of Christian community different than being part of another group? What makes it different than being part of a parenting group, or a ski club, or a gardening group, or even a group that dedicates itself to the environment or to climate change. Well, obviously, I hope, one of the differences around whom we gather, around the God made known to us in Jesus Christ. But I think what that community makes possible, what it more than makes possible, what it makes an expectation, what it demands of us, is that we find ourselves in community with those who are not always like us. Unlike all the other groups that we find ourselves associated with that are based on our interests or identity or commitments or causes, in the Christian community we are called to come close to, to know and even to love those who are different from us in every way possible by race or color, by gender identity or sexual orientation, by age or ability. We are called, even commanded, to overcome our natural human tendency to be suspicious of and hostile to those who are other, to take the risk of welcoming the stranger. It turns out that unlike all those other groups that attract us, the Christian community is the one place where we come not only to feel safe and secure and comforted, it's also a place where we come to be challenged, to feel uncomfortable at times, to be confronted by the unfamiliar, to be changed by our encounter with each other. 
which is all well and good. But how, in fact, do we do that? How do we love people who are different from us, who we might not even like that much? Because admit it, there's at least one person in every one of your congregation that in your secret heart, you don't actually like that much. <laughs> even the ministers have to confess to that. Well, the AA movement has 12 steps to follow, right? To practice over and over again, one day at a time. Followers of Jesus, on the other hand, have our own steps our own practices of the faith that sustain us. And we find them very simply described in our reading from the book of Acts for today, as the writer portrays the earliest Christian community. You wondered if I'd ever get to the scripture, didn't you? How do we love each other? Well, we spend time together. It seems obvious, but sometimes it doesn't translate. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, all who believed were together and had all things in common, and day by day, they spent much time together. How can we love each other if we don't spend time with each other? How can we know each other if we don't gather together? It's a simple practice, the one that Christian community is dependent on being together. It's hard to love each other if we don't come to know each other's stories, our joys and sorrows, not just we do what we do for a living or whose kids are whose, but also sharing our insecurities as well as our certainties, our brokenness as well as our accomplishments. And when I say, how do we love each other, I don't mean that warm, fuzzy feeling inside, right? Sometimes I confess the best way for me to love someone is simply to just stand being in their presence, to continue practicing openness and patience and respect even when I'm most frustrated, even as I am called to the personal and spiritual growth that God wants for me one day, one person at a time. But beyond spending time with each other, the second practice we attend to together is spending time with God, together in worship and on our own. They devoted themselves to the breaking of bread and the prayers. When we sit with God in speaking and listening, we remind ourselves that we are not alone, and more importantly, that we are not in charge. It's a glorious freedom to be reminded that we are not in charge, that we follow someone, that we worship someone who knows more, is older and wiser and more experienced, is more compassionate and more loving, more patient than we could ever be on our best day. And so we receive assurance that no matter how we or our community have failed this day, God will never fail. And we are opened up to see God again in each other. And the third practice we have is that of sharing. Sharing ourselves and what we have. We serve those who are suffering because we feel a deep sense of connectedness with all people, because we know they are other beloved children of God not from a sense of guilt or duty. And when we serve together in that ancient practice, we find often the best in each other. We see each other in a new light, which enables us to love one another in a new way. Sitting in that Lifeline meeting a few years ago, it struck me how similar the two movements were, the Christian Church and Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, there were superficial resemblances. They had welcoming and announcements. They had the reading of a sacred text and people sharing their personal testimony. They even took offering. And of course, they had refreshments afterwards. But much more importantly, what struck me was the purpose of both groups at our best, changed lives by the power of God, not just family, 
not just belonging, not just feeling comfortable or secure or valued or loved, which are all important, necessary things, but their deepest purpose is to change lives by the power of God, to be transformed people by the grace of God, that each are communities that come together around the hope of new life with practices that day by day lead into that life. And that each at our best have a way of living out of death and into freedom that can't help but attract the notice of others who see it and think, I want that for myself. That's the kind of community that welcomed me when I was first ordained 15 years ago. It was a really hard time in my life. I really struggled. I had a lot of personal drama and grief that I was working through. And it was a really hard time in the life of this congregation, which had a lot of congregational drama and grief to work through. And by God's grace, we embraced each other. And as we practiced together these ancient practices, as we gathered together, as we worshiped, as we broke bread with glad and generous hearts, as we devoted ourselves to serving the community, the resurrection life bubbled up inside of me and inside of this congregation. Hallelujah, Hallelujah indeed. Amen. That's the kind of community that welcomed another ordinand, Fran Darling, and then graciously and courageously accompanied her in her ministry and her dying and her death. And it's the kind of community that welcomes you now, John and Laurel, as you bring your gifts and challenges, your questions and your insights to be woven into the fabric of this congregation's life. I know I and everyone here is praying for a fruitful and faithful and long ministry here together at Shemanus United Church. As you together devote yourself to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, as you share things in common and distribute to those in need, as you praise God and seek the goodwill of your neighbors, may day by day the power of God be at work in you and through you, that lives will be changed. May it be so. Amen. <laughs>